Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India And I'll be giving this course in essentials in immunology along with two other instructors, Dr. Anjali Karandi and Dr. Deepankar Nandi. I'm beginning this course to give you an introduction to this subject of immunology, subsequent to which the other, instru other instructors will start their own portions for the course. So, this lecture 1 mainly consists of topics dealing with the history of immunology. Now, what is immunology? Now, immunology, immunity, the Latin term immunity actually means exempt and the English term immunity means state of protection from infectious disease. And I am sure that all of us and all of you also know that immunology deals with the mechanisms that are involved in the reactions of the body's immune system to different substances that it encounters during its life. Now, these substances could include foreign, for example, pathogens like viruses, bacteria which cause infection and disease. And not only that, it may also inclu include self moieties or self proteins that can cause a reaction as what happens during autoimmunity. Basically, to kind of look at immunology, immunology is all about self and non self discrimination. That means, your body's immune cells distinguish between what is self to you and what is non-self to you. Also, there is the increasingly evident concept that immunity involves actually perception of danger from non-danger. Now, if you were to look at the distinction between self and non-self, self and non-self actually is not so much peculiar only to higher organisms like mammals. It is also seen in very, very primitive animals, especially even in annelids. You will see here that earthworms also exhibit this phenomena of distinction from self and non-self. If you take a piece of skin from an earthworm from one locality and graft it on to another one from a different locality here shown in red. You will see that the red earthworm actually rejects the black one. However, if you have a skin graft that is taken from the same locality earthworms then there is actually acceptance. Now, this primitive uh, distinction between self and non-self can also be seen in many other um, lower order um, specimens like for example, in corals. Now, all of you know that corals have a lot of polyps. Now, if you take these polyps from one, uh, one polyp and then graft it on to another polyp, the red one here is shown strangling the green one, which means that there is a distinction between self and non-self. Actually, all these polyps are growing on the shell which is inhabited by the hermit crab. Now, such sort of examples are evident in many other uh, orders of the uh, orders of the immune system like you will see in different and, uh, phyla and so on and so, so forth, but the immune system has evolved into a very complex system in higher animals much more about all this later on during a lecture in evolution of the immune system. 
Now, to begin with the history of immunology, why history of immunology? Because if you look at history, you will actually come to appreciate some of the discoveries as they were made and this discovery actually helps us to put together or put in place what we are learning in class today. Basically, this course in immunology, I will be trying to make things clear and try to present them in a much more simple manner. The same thing that is already available in many immunology textbooks like Kobe uh, immunology and several other textbooks, which we will give up give a, a, a kind of reference to later on uh, during the classes. So, to look at history of immunology, if you really look at it, it probably began as man evolved. There is no beginning to this history of immunology. Now, if you look at various historic, historical texts, you will see the scourge that plague was uh, causing during the ancient history and references have been made to this. But a systematic um, entry of historical events actually begins with what happened with Edward Jenner. And you will see that Edward Jenner in 1798 came up with a vaccination against smallpox. And during those days, smallpox was a scourge. It was killing a lot of people, disfiguring those who actually survived this disease. Edward Jenner actually looked at the causes and effects of the variole vaccine. Now, varus means pimples and vacca means cow. So, why this pimples and cow? Because during those days, it was a kind of a widely accepted uh, observation that these milkmaids or cow maids who used to milk cows, they used to come down with some disease called as cowpox, where they had sores on their skin. And these people rarely ever came down with smallpox. And therefore, this association between pimples and cow and the word variolation. In fact, the smallpox derives or derives its meaning from small pokes. Pokes means holes because these are the uh, kind of pock marks that are uh, that that form the face of individuals who come down with smallpox. Now, before this, actually, just to make some brief reference to the first in first century B.C., you find that King Mithridates actually injected himself with increasing doses of poison to avoid being killed by a murderer who may poison him later. But the ironical part of this story is that when actually he got depressed and he wanted to commit suicide by taking poison, the poison had no effect on him. Now, another curious fact is this injection of poison increases increasing doses of poison is actually followed when you make anti sera against snake venom. So, how is anti sera against snake venom made? They take very small concentrations of this snake venom that will not kill horses and inject them to begin with and then follow it up with slowly or increasing doses or increasing concentrations of this uh, snake venom and get this anti sera which will neutralize the snake venom which has to be given to people who have a snake bite and have had a, ha, had a chance to come to the hospital to receive it. Apart from this, another historical fact in, in 1712, Mary Pierre Ripont, who was the wife of Edward Montague, she was a known beauty, but later on after marriage, she was affected by smallpox and therefore, her, her face became disfigured. Fortunately, she survived the attack. And then, when when her husband went to as an earl of Sand, uh, he, he was the earl of Sandwich, and when he when he went to went to Turkey as an ambassador, she learnt of this practice of variolation, which was widespread in Turkey, but was not known in other parts of the world. She took it upon herself to try and popularize this technique of variolation. Variolation, and then of course you know in 1798 about the story of Edward Jenner, who. Uh, injected the small boy with uh, uh, cowpox and then actually challenged him with actual smallpox uh, material uh, and saw that the that the boy was actually protected. 
Now, Jenner was so, so great during that time that thousands of people actually admired him for a discovery. He was so famous and so much admired, admired that during this war between Britain and France, this great person Napoleon whom, whom all of you know about actually when he was requested by Jenner to release some British prisoners of war, he said ah Jenner I can refuse him nothing. He even made or minted him a specialized medal commem commem commemorating him for his solution to the smallpox issue. So, you can see that Jenner was actually a role model during his time. Then strange coincidence that we were mentioning about uh, Vaca being cow and here you have this uh, supreme godhead who is Lord Krishna associated with the cow and uh, much more interesting is the fact that, that these gopikas who are always uh, going around uh, with cows or uh, cow maids were always lovers of Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna was loving them quite a bit. Now, going on you see in the history of immunology in 1878 subsequent to Edward Jenner, it was Louis Pasteur who may who is who is a great name in your textbooks. He is known for his rabies vaccine and of course, the attenuation of bacteria. Now, his students and, and followers Emily Rox and Alexander Yersin also con contributed a lot to, to the development of immunology. Now, what they did was that they were working on a Corrini bacterium diphtheriae. Now, this Corrini bacterium diphtheriae derives its term from diphthera, diphthera meaning throat. So, this particular organism grows in the throat of newborns, yet this growth, growth in the throat actually kills the newborn. So, how is it possible that when the bacteria is residing in the throat, it can kill the individual. So, they said that this particular uh, organism is secreting a toxin and this toxin they called it as diphtheria toxin. So, they propounded this concept that actually toxins cause diseases. Then it was actually M. L. von Bering and Shibasa, Shibasaburo Kitasato who discovered that when you inject these toxins, because toxins were available by growing these bacteria in petri plates, they take the culture filtrates of these bacteria and prepare these toxins. And then one of the uh, uh, experimental models uh, of those days was using chicken or using dogs or using rabbits or even guinea pigs. So, they used to take these toxins and inject them into these larger animals and they took the blood of those animals which were resistant to this toxin. In other words, they were not killed by this toxin and they found that this blood of resistant animals had the ability to the block the action of the toxin in that the toxic effect of the toxin when administered to a naive animal, it could neutralize that ability. So, they said this phenomena of neutralizing the effect of the toxin was actually because they had antitoxins. So, these antitoxins had the property of neutralizing the toxic nature of the toxin that was produced by these bacteria. And then they found that these antitoxins were actually very specific to each or that bacterial strain or bacteria. So, they found that when you took these toxins that are secreted by one, uh, one type of bacteria, they would be very specific to that bacteria and they would not neutralize the toxin that is secreted by other types of bacteria. So, then these students of this great person actually there is a kind of a tragic uh, history that is associated with this rabies vaccine, because this person Joseph Meister as a boy as a 8 year old boy was the first person to receive this rabies vaccine. Um, and then after he became resistant to this ra uh, rabies by this vaccination, he turned out to become an employee of the Pasteur Institute which was founded in France all of you know about Pasteur Institute and he served in that institute as a gate, gatekeeper for many years for about 40 years. And the tragedy is that 
when the Germans invaded Paris during the war, they ordered him to open Pasteur's script in 1940. And he was so depressed that he could not manage to do that and therefore, he committed suicide. So, such are the incidents in history which are actually a, a great uh, you know a great incidents that actually make us remember uh, so many things that have happened in the history of immunology. So, that was about Louis Pasteur and then his students and then we come on to other kinds of observations that were made by these scientists Pfeiffer, von Gruber and Durham. And they discovered that when they injected these toxi toxins to these animals, the blood or the blood or they call a body humor which was known uh, as, as what it was known during those days. This, this is nothing but anti sera. you just take the blood and allow it to clot and what you have when you remove the clot is called as the serum and therefore, this, this serum had those anti toxin material and this anti, to, anti sera they found not only did it react to the toxin, it also reacted with the bacteria that secreted the toxin. So, in other words you had the body humor responding by making antibody or you inject this body which body is nothing but the toxin during those days which they refer to. And this antibody would now recognize not only the body that was injected, but also the bacteria that was secreting that was also injected into that into that animal. And then came the concept about how these uh, these anti sera there were a lot of work that was uh, that was conducted uh, uh, on on the subject of lysing bacteria with this uh, body humor or antibody and including a glutination and opsonins. Opsonin is nothing but a phenomena where you you coat macrophages with with these antibodies and the macrophage becomes activated to go and engulf those organisms. So, this this phenomena is called as opsonization. So, then in 1897 a very important observation which helps us to understand many of the simple things that came later on, which we rarely look at it from that point of view when we study immunology textbooks in our BSCs and MSCs. And that is this observation in 1897 by Rudolf Cross. Now, what did he observe? He observed something he was doing experiment you know, you know during those days people were experimenting uh, like in chemistry, chemistry labs that we do in BSc trying to identify compounds or different groups by dif mixing different chemical reagents in test tubes like what you see here. And then if you, if you had the presence of a precipitate you would conclude that it is one, one, one group when you if you did not have that precipitate you would go on to uh, test it for a, a different type of group. So, this actually these, these uh, experiments that were done in the chemistry lab is what uh, was, was done by this Rudolf Krauss. So, and also one more important point is that uh, all of these experiments were done macro volumes. You know these days we talk we talk about trying to do reactions with a small drop of blood. During those days it was more in terms of 10 ml, 20 ml and 50 ml of blood. So, they found that when you took these uh, immune serum or this or the serum that was prepared from these uh, uh, challenged animals or injected animals, they had the ability to cloud bacterial filtrates. In other words, you grow bacteria and then you spin down and then remove the bacteria and take the filtrate and you mix them with this anti serum, they found that there was a precipitate like this what, what is shown here in the test tube. And in fact, this was what actually developed into some sort of a quantitation for the, uh, the antigen antibody complex. Antigen meaning that which was injected into the animal to produce this antibody and therefore, it is called as an immunogen which whatever substance that combines with the antibody in the test tube that substance is called as the antigen. So, therefore, the antigen combines with the antibody in the test tube to form, form a complex and at the right concentration actually precipitates out. The word immunogen was is being applied or is the term immunogen is used for all for probably the same protein, but when injected into the animal. So, if you look at later developments in fact, the scientist Octoloni 
and all of you must have uh, been exposed to this octoloni test, where you have these white arcs forming between two wells that have been punched in an agarose plate or a petri plate that is containing this um, uh, agarose which has been poured after being molten and then allowed to solidify. And therefore, you had anti serum in one well and, and you had antigen in the other well, you allow it to diffuse and at the right concentration, which is also called as the zone of equivalence, you had a precipitation in here. And in fact, this precipitation is actually nothing but this, precip this precipit precipitate that is forming in your octoloni plate. So, you can see how these, this observation was later actually applied in order to look at similarity between different kinds of antigens and also to try and quantitate the amount of antigen that is present either in the well or in other kinds of situations. In fact, this particular observation actually developed later on by using radioactive tracers in, in, into a very, uh, very, very sensitive technique uh, called as radio immunoassay, which was discovered by Yalo. Now, now, going on, now the history of immunology in 1893, Hans Buchner, he said that there is something else that is very distinct from the that what, what was already discovered and what was widely discussed as being uh, a kind of uh, something that was a, a great discovery which is which it was during that time. He said that the serum has something else which is distinct from antibodies which had the ability to lyse bacteria. How did they find this out? He found this out by taking serum from naive animals or those animals which were not been exposed to that particular antigen or bacteria. Now, when he mixed that serum along with the bacteria and along with the, with the antibody or um, uh, the resistant serum, he found that this serum had the ability to increase the lysis of that bacteria in which it was mixed with. Now, this increased capacity to lyse bacteria was actually destroyed when you heated the serum to 56 degrees. So, he said that this distinct serum factor was inactivated by heating to 56 degrees. In fact, that is what we still we even today do for the inactivation of the serum factor which was which he called as alexin or nowadays called as complement. So, he was the in, in 1895 actually all these observations were, uh, were actually concluded by Jules Bordet who discovered this particular complement by using Vibrio cholerae. So, you see you re, during those times also cholera, cholera was, was abundant and uh, from where they got all this Vibrio cholerae. Now, so, the, all these observations along with the discovery that you could generate antibodies to many substances including other proteins other than toxins, other than bacteria including things like RBC actually gave rise to the birth of a subject called a serology, which is very much uh, involved in immunology. Now, what does complement? We were talking about complement. Now, complement actually involves a set of proteins, which you will be studying, studying about in later classes that are activated by antibodies. So, when antibodies bind to the bacteria that they are specific to, these antibodies have the ability to activate a set of 9 fragments of complement, which actually come together like this over here to form a pore into the cell to which the antibody has bound and which has uh, which has bound to complement. And these pores have actually been visualized by electron micro, micrograph, micrography to see that you can see this so clearly over there. So, these pores actually allow the contents of the, of the cell to lyse out and therefore, you have bacterial lysis. Now, going on with the history, you see in 1926, Lloyd and Felton and Bailey came up with a landmark discovery that antibody is actually protein in nature and it was not any other kind of uh, material. How did they do that? You know what they do? They, it is a simple concept, but 
during that time it was a, a really it led to a great discovery. Now, what they saw was they took purified pneumococcal polysaccharide. Now, all of you know what are polysaccharides and polysaccharide suffice it to say that it is not protein. Now, they took this polysaccharide and they mixed it with antiserum that they had developed by injecting this pneumococcal polysaccharide into animals like rabbits. So, they took this antiserum that they had bled from rabbits and they mixed it with this polysaccharide. Now, as I told you earlier, there was a clouding and there was a precipitate. So, they could take that precipitate by spinning it down and they found that this complex or the precipitated complex were had protein in it by testing for protein. So, how, how is it possible that when you had a pure polysaccharide, when you mix it with antiserum, you had protein in it and therefore, that had to be the antibody that had bound to the polysaccharide and therefore, it had to be protein in nature. Then came the discovery that this protein factor was actually globulin. Now, what are globulins and what is albumin? How, how was this discovery made? This discovery was actually made in 1937 by Tiselius and Cabot, who discovered that these antibodies were actually gamma globulins. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, just before, before or during this time when Tiselius was discovering electrophoresis, which we, which we take for granted these days in any lab. During the 1930s, it was Karl Landsteiner, a very great scientist, who actually looked at the role of carbohydrates in blood groups and all this ABO blood grouping that we know about that we have to have our blood, uh, blood group tested. Uh, for getting blood in case of accidents and so on and so forth was actually discovered by in 1930 by Karl Landschleiner. And he also discovered the role of hapten, which is a small chemical also can make an antibody, but it cannot induce antibodies in animals unless it is coupled to proteins. More about this in your antibody class, but in 19, 1950s it was Edelman and Porter, Porter who actually came up with the basic structure of immunoglobulin molecules and that this immunoglobulin molecule was having two chains and that is that it has a heavy chain and it had a small uh, smaller uh, smaller smaller chain and it is written as a y which uh, which has got disulfide bridges more of that later on now if you look at these incidences how what was it that told told Tiselius and Cabot that actually this antibody was a gamma globulin. What is the experiment that they did? They immunized rabbits with ovalbumin. You know, during those days, all these experiments with blood grouping and the fact that blood was easily available in a slaughterhouse because they would kill they would kill the sheep and so there was a lot of blood available. So, they, they could have access to uh, red blood cells, they could take this blood spin out the spin out the blood cells the RBCs and experiment with it. So, they took this as an antigen which was easily available and they started injecting it into various animals. So, in fact, sheep red blood cell is a very very convenient antigen which is highly immunogenic, immunogenic meaning that it has the ability to be strongly induce the formation of antibodies in different animals like rabbits. So, if you took sheep blood blood cell and injected them into, uh, sh into rabbits, you would get anti sheep red blood cell antibodies. And of, co of course, all these injections has to be in an animal different from the one that the RBC was taken from and that is because of the phenomena called as tolerance which you will come to study later on. So, they injected these rabbits with ovalbumin. So, sheep red blood cell was, was a convenient antigen, ovalbumin was another convenient antigen which you could get from eggs and another famous antigen is called as KLH called as keyhole limpet hemocyanin. Limpet is a bivalve and hemocyanin is the blood pigment that is available in these bivalves and keyhole is a place, it is a beach uh, and therefore, uh, they would take all these bivalves which washed up on the on the beach and extract this blood pigment and use it for uh, use it as antigens. So, after injecting this ovalbumin, they bled these rabbits after some time. So, they had anti serum that was available. 
this anti serum they electrophoresce. So, they subjected it to electric current and they separated the various components. Now, along with uh, doing this experiment with this immunized serum, they also did another kind of a treatment. Some of this anti serum they took and incubated it with ovalbin, which was the which was the antigen that was injected in the first place. And then, so the principle expected was that the anti ovalbumin would combine with the ovalbumin antibodies and therefore, try and see what would happen when these were electrophoresed. So, they did this electrophoresis and they, they found that you had several peaks that were separating. So, if you were to mark this particular separation plus and minus and then you looked at the absorbance during those days they were uh, they were actually electrophoresing serum in in kind of large volumes in in different uh, material like uh, uh, kind of a uh, round wall glass tubes and they would look at the absorbance of the various bands that were separating and they found that actually when they looked at the absorbance there was one peak and then they had three other peaks like that so, they call this one was turned turned out to be albumin, which a lot was known about that uh, about which lot lot was known, because there was a lot of egg albumin and albumin would always be used uh, for cooking or uh, preparing various kinds of things in the kitchen. So, apart from albumin they had three other peaks called uh, they called it as globulins. So, they call these as globulins. So, anything coming later and later than albumin was called as globulins and they called it as alpha, beta and gamma. So, you had alpha globulin, you had beta globulin and you had gamma globulin. So, they took this material now which was combined with the ovalbumin. So, the immune serum that had combined with the ovalbumin and the electrophoresed and this is the profile that they got. They got this peak very much as it was, they got the alpha, they got the beta also, but the gamma was severely depleted and this depletion basically becoming because of that adsorption or because of the adsorption of antibodies. So, this was the experiment that Tisselius and Kabat did to discover these, these, these were actually gamma globulins. So, you will see that this kind of uh, experimentation and the use of uh, these kinds of experimental techniques including the precipitation is actually used even during these modern day uh, immunodiagnostics to look at immunological disorders. So, this is a technique called as immunoelectrophoresis. Basically, it is a electrophoresis combined with the octroloni type of double diffusion, where you have the formation of arcs. So, in this immunoelectrophoresis, those patients which do not make IgA or IgA insufficiency or not do not make IgM can be diagnosed by the disappearance or the or the non appearance of a particular or the absence of a particular precipitate that forms when you incubate these uh, serum with anti IgM, anti IgA or anti IgG. So, you see that this kind of precipitation technique how, how well it is uh, it was used even for immunodiagnostics. Now, while all these things were happening there was other kinds of discoveries being made which was being made at the uh, which was made at the end of 19th century. All of you have heard of Eli Mechnikov. And Eli Mechnikov, of course, you always put him together with the discovery of macrophages and phagocytosis. So, it is said that uh, if you look at the books, you actually read that Mechnikov uh, actually on a Christ this discovered this uh, particular or uh, thought this thought of this idea during a Christmas Eve, because he had this uh, Tenenbaum uh, in his home on which all these gifts were, uh, were, were hung up for those kids during Christmas Eve. So, they would get these gifts uh, the next day as a Christmas present. So, he found that when he took a thorn from the tree and then because his house was near the beach, he had a lot of 
access to starfishes you know starfishes come up on the beach uh, quite often and uh, these starfish actually have a larva called as the bipinaria larva now the unique thing about bipinaria larva is that they are transparent so, what is happening within the larva if there are cells within the larva and in fact, there are cells in the in this larva you can see these cells moving around. Now, that was that is the advantage with these larva in fact, modern day biology also has its equivalents like having transparent systems model systems to study and th that is uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, you know the once the zebra fish um, hatch out from their eggs they are transparent and you there is a lot of work that is being done on how these cells combat mycobacterium uh, uh, tuberculosis by looking looking at how these cells move within those uh, fishes <coughs> excuse me so here you see that when he poked the thorn he came back after a couple of hours and he found that this thorn was actually surrounded by these mobile cells which were motile within the larva. So, therefore, he actually got the idea that these, these uh, cells were uh, surrounding the thorn in order to engulf the thorn. Uh, now, what we study as phagocytosis you can imagine that all these things were derived from this observation that Eli Meshnikov made. Then of course, in 1903 Almuth Wright and Stuart Douglas they came up with a system for measuring this phagocytosis called as phagocytotic or phagocytic index and then you had the phenomena of opsonization discovery of opsonization as I had already as I have already told you earlier. Then of course, another epoch discovery was made by Robert Koch <coughs> and this epoch discovery was the discovery of tuberculin reaction. You know this tuberculin reaction is a reaction that is being still done uh, nowadays to look at your exposure to mycobacteria. So, this tuberculin reaction was actually discovered that it was what you call as a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction. And of course, this was then later on discovered that this discovery of um, delayed type uh, DTH reactions could actually be transferred only with cells and not with antibodies. So, if you had a sensitized individual, it is something similar to your reaction to poison IV. So, if you transferred you took cells from a sensitized animal and inject it into a non sensitized animal and then exposed it to this particular tuberculin. <coughs> you had a kind of a, um, a something redness and uh, making of a, a kind of a wheel on the on, on your skin on the animal skin later on after a certain certain amount of time. So, this all these actually actual discoveries were actually alluding to the fact that in addition to antibodies something was being contributed by the cells <coughs> because macrophages are cells they are cells that are motile within this larva and this DTH reaction could be transferred not by serum or antibodies, but by only by cells when they were given to the other uh, other animal. So, therefore, all these observations were actually pointing out that in addition to what is called as humoral immunity body humor containing these antibodies, there was something else that, that contributed to uh, full blown immunity and that that was that the contribution was coming from something other than antibodies and that had to be cells. So, therefore, if you look at to look at the entire scenario you see that all your the discovery of macrophages in fact, these neutrophils actually coming out from your blood capillary when a when a thorn is poked into your skin rather than the bipinaria larva you had you know the remarkable thing about this is that the bacteria in the thorn themselves actually serve as a as an attractant to these neutrophils or macrophages. Now, these are all components of what you call as innate immunity which I will be describing to you sometime later, which involves the migration of macrophages. Not only do they have to migrate to the place where you have poked the thorn or the thorn was poked into your uh, or into your skin by accident, 
you find that those cells have to move out exactly in that location and not anywhere else. <coughs> so, this these neutrophils have to move out from your blood blood vessel or blood capillaries and then come out and then migrate towards the thorn and then phagocytose the bacteria. In fact, as I told you bacteria have certain molecules which are chemotactic to these cells and these molecules are present in the cell wall of bacteria. So, these, these cell walls actually you, you heard of formyl, methionyl, F met leu phi, methionyl, leucyl, phenylalanine. So, this tripeptide which was formylated because formylation is something that happens in bacteria and not in higher, higher animals. So, you see this formyl peptide could actually be chemotactic to these neutrophils. So, that was how the macrophages actually still I mean which was discovered uh, so long ago play such a great role even today in your bodies. So, then the cellular immunity was actually uh, strengthened by the fact the discovery of this the function for the bursa of Fabricius. So, there was a lot of experiments being done looking at this clouding or precipitation of, of antibodies with that specific that is specific to a particular antigen. And then of course, all, all they were trying to quantitate the formation of this complex. So, if you had injected an animal let us say with oval women, they would take the blood and try to see by this immunoprecipitation reaction to see how much antibody was being made in the blood of those rabbits or, or sheep or whatever. So, when you look at all these different kinds of experiments, there was an experiment done on the bursa of Fabricius. Now, this bursa was actually discovered way back in 1621 okay, by a person called as Hieronymus Fabricius and therefore, it is called as bursa of Fabricius. Now, during that time and uh, there was a lot many many experiments were done to see what is the function of this bursa in birds. So, one of the ways you look at uh, organ function is to try and remove that organ and then try to see what functions or what is absent in the, um, the person or, or, uh, or, the, or the animal that has that, that the organ has been removed from. So, you have heard of various kind of uh, terms like bursectomy, thymectomy, hypophysectomy to look at the functions of all these various um, organs. So, they you know they were doing a lot of experiments involving uh, bursectomy. So, they would remove the bursa and then try to take these uh, chicken and then try to see what what type what type of function would be missing in these uh, bursectomized uh, birds. But to their surprise they had never come up with any abnormality of these birds. So, they were at a loss to explain the function of the of the bursa. Now, the function of this bursa was actually found out by accident. So, in other words it was a serendipitous discovery by two graduate students in 1956. Okay. So, look at the discovery in 1621 and the function being attributed in 1956. So, two graduate students called as Bruce Click and Timothy Chang, okay, they actually discovered the function of this bursa and as I told you it was a it was a chance discovery. The chance was or, or the, the, the happening was that uh, several students went to went to Timothy Chang to try and learn how to evaluate the formation of these immune complexes or this precipitation with antibodies. So, Timothy Chang did not have any chicken in his lab or birds in his lab. So, he borrowed these birds from a different lab uh, from Bruce Glick's lab. And then he took these birds and injected these birds with uh, Staphylococcus bacteria to show these students that after some time you will get uh, these antibodies that could precipitate the Staphylococcus. And uh, to his surprise and to the um, uh, chagrin of all the students who had come to learn this technique, they found that the, the whole experiment failed because there was no immunoprecipitation or there was no precipitate being formed when they mixed the serum with the Staphylococcus. So, then he was very much perturbed and then when he was discussing with uh, the whole matter with uh, Blue's click, he found that, uh, that uh, he had maintained some records. So, they went back to all the records 
and they found that these birds had the bursa of Fabricius removed. So, they were in fact bursectomized. So, then came the discovery that actually bursa was involved in the formation of antibodies and this bursa was making cells. It was not that the bursa was led to the secretion of antibodies, but the cells in the bursa of Fabricius was what was responsible for the secretion of antibodies later on when they were exposed to a particular immunogen. So, this, this was the discovery of the function of bursa of Fabricius and therefore, all these cells were named after the bursa which starts with a B and therefore, it was called as a B cell. So, now you know how the B cell derives its name from. Now, simultaneously there were a lot of experiments as I told you to look at the function of the thymus. So, they would take out the thymus and uh, please note that all this bursectomy removal of the bursa or the thymus has to be done at very early stage. So, this bursectomy has to be done soon after hatching and thymectomy has to be done soon after soon after the uh, you have the birth of the uh, mouse pup. Uh, therefore, you see that it is called as neonatal thymectomy. So, the thymus actually regresses in adult life. So, if you remove the thymus from an adult there is no effect on the immune response. Only if you remove the thymus from, from a neonate you will have its effects on, on the various cells of the body and during those times they actually found that removal of the thymus also led to a decrease in the number of the cells that were circulating in this blood. So, there was a lot of immunology, immunochemical uh, kind of techniques, uh, immunohistological techniques or immunochemical techniques that were being done during those days. When one of the tests were to look at what different types of uh, blood cells were available in, in, your, in your blood. In fact, that is something that is done even in modern day diagnostics to look at the different kinds of uh, different blood types in, in the blood that is drawn from a patient. So, when you look at this you see that uh, when you uh, stain with either hemat hem hem hematoxylin eosin or do what is called as a diff difficult test you find that there are different kinds of blood cells and they are they are diff they differ by morphological criteria and there are there are cells with large nuclei and there are cells with uh, segmented uh, nuclei and there are cells with uh, kind of a bilobed nuclei. So, there were small cells also smaller compared to all these other cells called as basophils, eosinophils and neutrophils and these small cells they called as lymphocytes. So, during this bursectomy and thymectomy they found that the, the number of these small types of lymphocytes and they would stain differently also outside of the nucleus the cytoplasm would stain differently and the other cells would stain different as you can see in, in these two pictures. So, they had some sort of an inkling that the cells also played a major role when you removed the thymus or the bursa and bursa of course, was implicated in the formation of antibodies. So, came about the, uh, the concept that, that the immunity actually derives from two different arms or two different types of immunity in your body called as humoral immunity which is actually resulting from the B cells and therefore, they make antibodies which circulate in your blood and they can combine with the antigen in a, in a test tube and these were called as humoral immunity because it is in your body humor or blood as opposed to the cellular immunity which involves cells and these included a lot of cells different kinds of cells B cells T cells which are involved in, in killing and so forth. So, uh, now we realize of course, that to get a full blown optimal immune response to a pathogen you need the participation and the cooperation between humoral immunity and cellular immunity. So, looking at all the different kinds of aspects and looking at all the different kinds of cells let us see what are the different different kinds of cells of the or the of the immune system. And if you look at the different cells of the immune system if you look at any immunology textbook you have here what I have represented here is that how the all these differentiated cells which you have come to hear about now like the monocyte, the neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils and other types of cells that are listed in this slide actually differentiate from precursors. So, in this slide I have put together 
in a way that shows you by an arrow, an arrow mark standing for the final differentiating uh, differentiated cell and then they are coming from uh, a one that is put in square which is called as a progenitor cell and this progenitor cell actually coming or developing from what is called as a stem cell. Now, this stem the concept of a stem cell is very much evident these days, it is becoming uh, important uh, for, uh, for uh, biology and uh, both in terms of uh, scientific and legal implications, because you can have a stem cell uh, regenerating different types of cells in your body. And uh, looking at the differentiation of these different kinds of blood cells, you realize that all these different kinds of blood cells with its different morphological characteristics and also uh, different types of uh, uh, contents within them actually derive from different kinds of precursors. So, you have actually what is called as a hematopoietic stem cell as opposed to a pluripotent stem cell. A pluripotent stem cell is one which has the capacity to differentiate into different types of uh, cells as opposed to a hematopoietic stem cell, which is a stem cell that gives rise only to blood cells. So, a pluripotent stem cell is what gives rise to a hematopoietic stem cell and this hematopoietic stem cell then starts to develop into different kinds of stem cells. So, in this case you have a myeloid stem cell and you have a lymphoid stem cell. Now, all these stem cells nowadays are distinguished by the presence of markers, markers meaning kind of proteins. They are also called, they are also called as cluster of differentiation C D. They are labeled as C D because they stand for cluster of differentiation. So, these are found on the cell surface. So, you can actually look at the presence of these by looking at specific reagents that bind to these cell surface proteins. So, these are these are specific to certain kinds of cells and those which are common to uh, different kinds of cells. So, these are called as markers. So, you have a marker called as stem cell antigen 1. So, this stem cell antigen 1 is actually a, a marker for this pluripotent stem cell. So, using this the presence of these markers nowadays they can isolate these stem cells and look at the presence of stem cell antigen 1 and make sure that is that it is in fact uh, and purify them that is, and make sure that it is in fact a, a stem cell. So, you can have these different kinds of stem cells and you see that uh, this develops into two different kinds of like you have the lymphoid stem cell and the myeloid stem cell and when you look at the myeloid stem cell you see that it gives rise to a erythro erythroid progenitor meaning that this is a precursor to the erythrocytes. In addition to this of course, you have this HSC having the ability to multiply not differentiate making more of its own kind called stem cell. That means, all these stem cells have the ability to differentiate into different kinds of cells in the blood. So, apart from this erythroid lineage, you have the megakaryocyte lineage or the megakaryocyte progenitor which gives rise to platelets. Now, platelets are vasoactive you know in, in your blood and they are very much important in clot formation. They are the ones which actually uh, help in making your blood clot and not bleed to death. So, then of course, you have the granulocyte monocyte lineage which gives rise separately to a monocyte progenitor which finally differentiates into what are called as tissue macrophages. And these tissue macrophages are called by different names in de depending upon which skin or under which skin that they are found in your body. Now, the same progenitor gives rise to what are called as neutrophils, which is also responsible not only for chemotaxis, but it is also responsible for making different kinds of uh, uh, reactive substances like uh, you know oxygen radicals and so on and so forth. Then you have the eosinophil progenitor which gives rise to eosinophils, basophil progenitor which gives rise to basophils, it also gives rise to mast cells. So, all these take part in allergic reactions, <coughs> excuse me. In addition to this of course, giving coming down to the lymphoid lineage, you have the B progenitor which gives rise to different kinds of B cells nowadays being distinguished by the presence of specific cell surface markers. But in this slide, I have just shown you two types called as T dependent and T independent because these B cells 
some of them which are T dependent are dependent on T cells to, to get cytokines from them and then so they are dependent on help derived from T cells. Whereas, there are other kinds of antigens that activate B cells in a T independent manner. As now of course, the T progenitor which gives rise to different kinds of T cells called as the T helper cells because they help B cells to make their antibodies. T cytotoxic T uh, cytotoxic cells which kill uh, infected infected bodies infected cells and of course, regulatory T cells which have the ability to uh, has as a feedback mechanism to regulate different kinds of cells. Now, all these different kinds of cells that you are seeing here in this in this uh, in this particular uh, table you find all these are determined by the availability of growth factors. For example, GMCSF plays a very growth, great role in the differentiation of granulocyte and monocytes. Similarly, IL 8, IL 7, IL 4 and IL 5 are very important for B cells. So, like this we will come to in the lymphokine class as to different kinds of uh, different kinds of lympho, lymph, uh, lymphokines that help all these different kinds of precursor cells to differentiate into all these different kinds of mature cells. So, the basically all this this timetable of development is actually driven by the presence of lymphokines, lymphokines that are available during the stem cell stem cell um, uh, development or during the, during the body's immune reactions where these particular progenitors are present. So, then of course, I will have to describe to you an experiment that shows the presence of the hematopoietic stem cell, where they showed that in fact, there is one type of cell called as the stem cell that gives rise to all the different kinds of cells in the body and therefore, you are actually um, uh, reorganizing this body immune system by, by uh, from this particular stem cell. More of this in the next class, because I am out of time in this for this lecture number 1 and therefore, I will conclude this lecture and then when we come back for lecture number 2, we will look at this experiment and then go on to look at how B cells and T cells were actually discovered and uh, all these different other kinds of experiments. So, to end this particular, uh, particular uh, lecture, you you have this lecture number 1 showing you the different events in, uh, in the history of immunology uh, including the discovery of the bursa of Fabricius and then in the next class we go on to look at how stem cells are uh, can repopulate uh, an immune system or make up a ma mature immune system and how it was how how it was shown and the various kinds of cells that derive from it and experiments that, that were done.